My name is Dave Smith, and I'll be talking to you about the power of Q. My objective with this talk is to teach everyone how to project blue flame from your hands like this. Is that possible? Yeah, we'll get it. We'll get there. Um, just for reference, how many of you remember playing this video game? Yeah? OK, by show of hands, was it Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis? Super Nintendo. All right, Sega Genesis. Yeah. Super Nintendo wins, and I agree, it had better bass. All right. So um, I love to tell bad jokes at the beginning of my talks. But today, I promise you that I will not do that. Uh, All, right. All right. So as JavaScript developers, we love asynchronous operations. Our language is so good at it. It's one of the things, one of the killer features of JavaScript. Um, but you can do it wrong, and I've done it wrong for a long time, and I've seen the light. This is the old way. The idea is you have a function whose job is to do an asynchronous operation. In this case, it's getting a resource from a URL on your server. Um, oh, I'm sorry, someone's pointing in the back. Oh, we need screens back here on any of the screens. Oh, these are good, right? Just those? Oh, we're good now. OK. So the job of this function is to get a resource from your server and then notify the caller when it's there. The obvious implementation is to pass a callback as the first parameter to your function, and then the code will call that callback as soon as the resource is available. No problem, right? Um, and here's how you would use it as a caller. You would say, get current user, pass in your callback, and off you go. The callback gets called, and the user object gets passed in. Now let's say we want to do another one. So the last function was get current user. This function is get permissions. Um, same story, same pattern, pass a callback. When the operation is complete, it calls your callback, and you're done. But what if I want to call both of them? And what if I need the data from both of them in the same context in order to satisfy some requirement of my application? Um, you simply can't do it in parallel, at least, this way, right? Because the user object is not available in the same scope as the permissions object. Well, there's an obvious solution to this, right? We'll just serialize it. We'll say get current user. When that callback gets called, we'll call get permissions. And when that got callback gets called, now we have access to both the user and the permissions. Bravo, end of talk. <laughs> okay. Let's say we need to do two more things. Well, now we have uh, the pyramid of callback doom. And a big frowny face appears on your code. Um, there are three problems with this approach. We already talked about the first one. It's not parallelizable. Number two, it is not composable. We'll show you what that means in, in a minute. And it is not dynamic. We had to define the structure at compile time, and statically. All right, we can do better with Q. We can shoot blue flame from our hands and do better. First of all, it's just simple two-step process to switch from callback passing to using promises. Step one, stop passing those callbacks as parameters. And step two, start returning promises. OK, here's how that same code would look if I were reporting it to $Q. Function get current user. First thing first, I declare a deferred object by asking the queue service to create a deferred object. Then, when my, uh, then I return that. Sorry, that deferred's promise. Then, um, when the operation completes later, I call deferred.resolve and pass in the object. All right, so far so good. And as a user, it really doesn't look that different to me. Um, I call it, and instead of passing my callback function directly to the uh, function as a parameter, Instead, the function has returned me a promise that I then pass my callback function to its then function. OK, I'm sure most of you have done this. If you've used Angular's HTTP service, you have done this. All right, it is very subtly different, but it is better. First of all, it's parallelizable, it's composable, and it's dynamic. I want to show you why that is. Here's why it's parallelizable. The queue service also ships with a really handy method called all. The all method takes as input an array of promises, and it operates on all of them, and it returns a new promise 
whose callback will be called when all of the promises passed to it have been resolved. Super nice, right? So in this case, we are passing in an array using get current user and get permissions, the same two functions we were just working on, except they return a promise now. And then I get a new promise that I call dot then on and pass in my callback. But now I get a responses object that's actually an array that contains the responses from those two promises that I passed in. All right? So that's pretty cool. But this can be even cooler. But first, I wanted to talk about my favorite spread. And that is, of course, Nutella. Um, I don't know if Nutella was born in France, but I enjoy it. And I love it here more than anywhere else. It's delicious. I had a crepe the other day with it on it, and it was just the best thing. Um, but there's my second favorite kind of spread is the function spread. And what it does is it makes this all syntax even a little cooler. Because what it, you may read that and think, I have no idea what that does. But it enables you to call, uh, to use your all function even better. Now, rather than walk through each bit of that code, I've given you links to where you can read about that. There's some weird stuff going on in it, but it's super cool. This is how it gets even better. So this time, notice, um, instead of getting back a responses array, I get back um, positional arguments for each element in that array. So it's cleaner. I, have to, I don't have to index into the array when I get my responses. I just call spread. And then it takes that array and applies the arguments from that array as function arguments to my callback. Super cool. OK? And it's almost as delicious as the best spread. OK, that was why they are parallelizable. Now, why are they composable? Every time I have a promise, I can call dot then on that promise, pass my function. Now, you may not know this. You obviously have passed functions to promises. But that dot then. Um, actually returns a new promise. And I can call dot then on that promise. And, I can, and when I do that, I get, you guessed it, a new promise. Um, these promises are not equal to each other. I just wanted to point this out. They are not the same object. This is not like a jQuery uh, function that returns back an instance of the same element you are operating on for chaining. This is, in fact, a whole new promise. When I resolve the first deferred object, that started this chain of promises, they will all, all promises will then be resolved um, in sequence, which is pretty cool. Promises are pretty functional. They are, as far as the observer is concerned, they are immutable. Now, they do actually have state that changes internally, but from my vantage point, they look immutable. Promises are dynamic. So, um, because we are not making decisions at code authorship time we can, uh, with our promises, we can do concurrent operations. At runtime, we can change which operations we're doing and still have our code look the same for dealing with the resolution. So here's an example. Um, let's say I've got an asynchronous operation that I want to perform, get current user. But then, depending on some state in my application, I may or may not need to go get the uh, user's permissions. Um, if I need to, I push that promise onto the list. If I don't, I don't. Then, um, later, I can just use q.all and wait for the responses to arrive. And I, my code doesn't have to be concerned with whether I needed one or both or more. And I could do this with as many promises as I want, and then be notified when they're all finished. They'll run in parallel. I like to call that runtime logic or dynamic logic over static logic, something JavaScript is very good at and promises make even better. OK. So the Q service is actually relatively small, but it does a couple of things. Um, first of all, this is a pattern that wasn't invented by the Q service, but is something that a lot of people have asked me about. Why do I have this three-step process? I have a deferred, I have a resolve call, and my caller has to do dot then. It feels like a bit of a burden when I could just pass my callback and call it. The purpose is to force a separation between the notifier and the receiver. The notifier is the entity of code that has access to the deferred object that constructed it and is responsible for notifying callers when the operation is complete. The receiver is the entity of code who is simply subscribing to these services by way of a promise. So the receiver does not have access to the deferred object. This is by design because otherwise they could accidentally trigger resolution before the operation is complete. The only entity that's able to trigger resolution is the entity that constructed the deferred object. And that's why they're separate. And that's why it feels maybe like a little bit of a burden when you're constructing these things. What about errors? Not all asynchronous operations end happily, as we know. 
Um, for those moments when things go wrong and you want to notify your callers that, yes, I'm finished, but no, it did not go well, you have the reject method. So previously we had called deferred.resolve. That is the happy path. This is when you want to pass back the requested data and to notify the caller that everything is fine. But you also have reject. Reject, you can also pass data, but then the caller who, hooked, who got your promise is allowed to connect a callback to a second argument in the then function. The first argument is the one we've all used and is commonly used, um, gets called on resolve or success, and the second argument gets called on failure or reject. Um, you really should hook up both if you want your application to be robust about handling all the different error cases. All right, so that's how that works. Um, there is now a third function that you can pass to your then function, um, and this is called the notification or progress or status callback. The idea behind this is that while your asynchronous operation is in progress, you might want to notify the caller that things are happening. Perhaps you have a file upload. Perhaps you have um, a long transfer or a multi-step um, background process that needs to be notify the caller that things are progressing to give the user a nice indication. You can call dot .notify on your deferred object as many times as you want over the life of your deferred object. And every time you call it, all promises that are subscribed will be notified, including all the chaining and magic you would expect to happen. The difference between this method and the resolve and reject is that you can call this as many times as you want, whereas reserve, uh, def, sorry, resolve and reject can only be called once each, and they're exclusive. You can only call one of those one time. So that's pretty handy and not super commonly used in my experience, but it can lead to a better user experience if you have access to status information. So deferreds, like I mentioned, they are one-time use objects. This is by design as well. I do believe, although I'm not sure, that the promise concept was heavily influenced by functional programming. That's why promises return new objects every time you connect a then function. And that's why I believe deferreds are meant for one-time use. However, if your promise is late to the party, it will still be notified. So for example, if you get a promise object that's connected to a deferred, and that deferred was already resolved in the past, your promise will immediately be resolved. Now this is super handy, because if you have an operation that was complete, your code isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily have to be aware of the timing. You can just pass in your promise, connect up your then function, and maybe you'll get a callback immediately because it's already done. So this makes it so you don't have to worry about that, which is really cool. Now, in uh, the queue service, this does not happen synchronously. This happens at the next digest loop, or the next tick. All right, now, this is probably my second favorite part of the queue service, which is good because there's only really three parts, or maybe four. Um, it's very small, but it's the when method. When, um, when I explain what when is to people, they're often like, I don't, I don't understand why that would be useful. So let me explain it to you conceptually, and then I'll show you a really cool example that we use in our app um, at my work that has made it super handy. So conceptually, the when function is all about taking values of any kind, wrapping them in promises, and returning them. Okay? Now, you can even pass in other promises, and wrap those in promises and return them, or you can pass primitive values or objects or whatever and return them wrapped up in a promise. So um, the reason that's good is because I like to wrap stuff up, especially when it's wrapped in bacon. But in this case, we're wrapping it in promises. So let me show you an example of what this looks like. Um, let's say you have an application that does uh, HTTP requests to the server, but you just want it to be a one-time request and then cache the data for subsequent requests. This is a pretty common pattern. Um, so what we're going to do is write a factory called movies. It has a variable called cached movies that's responsible for storing this cache. Um, and it exposes a single method called get movies. Now this method, you want the caller to be able to call it over and over and over again, but only the first time will it actually go to the server and fetch the data. So we use q.when to achieve this. So we're going to take advantage of JavaScript's short-circuited evaluation feature for the arguments to that function. And we're going to say cached q.when cached movies or helper. Now the idea here is that cached movies will initialize to undefined, which will cause in this or expression that to be not evaluated, or sorry, will be evaluated, determined to be falsy, and skip over to the next portion of the or expression, which is the helper function. So let's jump down to that helper function. 
It does the typical pattern, declares a defer, does an HTTP request, and when that request finishes, it stores the result in the cached movie's local variable. Um, and then resolves the promise. And then returns, of course, returns the promise as well. Now, the second time I call this service's get movies function, what's going to happen? Well, this time, cached movies is going to be truthy. Let's say it's an array of movies. And um, my queue.when will wrap that array up in a promise and return that instead of going back to the server. Right? It will not evaluate the second section of that or expression. This means that my callers can call getMovies.then and pass in a function and get the movies. And if it's already been cached, it'll resolve immediately and they'll have their data. If it hasn't been cached, they'll go to the server and get it. Pretty cool, huh? Yes, it's cool. Not as cool as blue flame shooting from your hands, but pretty cool. All right, this code has a bug. Um, yes, exactly. Thank you. Um, the, the answer is, what if someone calls this function in rapid succession um, before the first HTTP request completes? Well, you're going to end up issuing multiple HTTP requests. So I propose we fix that bug. I don't know about you, but I usually just fix bugs by pressing the spacebar key, and then I'm done. <laughs> We're going to add one more thing. So here, instead of just storing the cached movies in the scope of the service, we're also going to store a promise that I have creatively named P. Now, in our expression in the queue.when call, we're going to look at three different values. The first one is the cached movies. So remember, the first time you call this, that will be undefined. So we'll skip to the second piece of the expression, which is the P. And the first time you call this, that will be undefined. So we'll skip to the third section of the expression, um, the helper function. <coughs> Excuse me. The helper function will do what it did exactly before, except with one difference. When it gets its promise from the queue service, it will store it off in that p variable in the scope of the function. All right? Then it will go through its stuff and get its uh, movies, fetch them, and download them. Now, while that download is in flight, if someone else calls our getMovies function, what's going to happen? Well, let's go through it. GetMovies gets called. Q.Win is evaluated. Cached movies is still undefined, right? But what is p? P is now defined. It's a promise. So q.when will wrap up that promise in a new promise and return that to the caller. And guess what happens to that caller? When the original and only HTTP request is completed, they will get notified just like um, everybody else. So pretty cool. That is the power of q.when. It lets your code treat objects like promises, which lets you be very generic about your stuff, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. Very handy. All right. Um, by the way, HTTP already does caching, so, you know, <laughs> this is kind of a contrived example. But, um, you know, whatever. Um, and it uses promises, <laughs> right? So, you know, hey, need an example. Um, so promises are composable, and I, you can wrap them in other promises, and it can just go turtles all the way down and stack them up. It's really great. All right. Q really is Angular's champagne. So in version 1.2, um, there were only a couple of items on this list that were using promises internally in Angular, using the queue service anyway. Um, those were H the, the HTTP service, the interval, and timeout services. Um, as of 1.3, ng-animate, which by the way, I heard this really clever term today, ng-animatius, which I thought was pretty cool, um, so I added it. And uh, ng-model-controller um, also uses it for, that allows you to do asynchronous form validation, which is super cool. When I heard about that yesterday, I was super thrilled. And the template request, uh, service also does it. Now, I want to talk about request and response interceptors because these are so cool. So when my team started using Angular in 1.0, um, we had, Angular had response interceptors only. Is that right? Was it response or request? It was one side. Um, and so I put in a, a feature request on GitHub for the other side, request interceptors. Um, and so they started working on it, and then pretty soon someone had this brilliant idea. And so the idea of a request or response interceptor is simply this. Allow the caller to provide us code that we will run before and then after every HTTP request. Sounds simple, right? Well, they decided to build that interceptor system with promises. And the idea was um, the caller can specify a list of providers that will run before each HTTP request and a list of providers that will run after. And all those providers have to do is return a promise. Then the providers are chained one to another up to the HTTP request, and they all get to operate on the HTTP config and the request object. And then when the response comes back, they're all chained in reverse order on each other again. 
So at first glance, you might think, big deal. But this enables you to do asynchronous response and request interceptors on an already asynchronous operation at its heart, which is HTTP. So anyway, when they came up with that idea, I was just like, you guys are so awesome. <laughs> so cool. So why did the Angular team even do this? Um, first of all, uh, there already was a Q library, capital Q, uh, created by Chris Kowal, um, that's been in wide use and well recognized in the world. Um, so the, the main reason is that the Q service is aware of the digest loop. In fact, it depends on it. When you resolve a Q, dollar Q deferred object, it won't actually call the promises until the next digest loop. Okay? And the third reason is that basically the Angular team is a bunch of freaking geniuses. All right. I wanted to show you a little uh, test just to demonstrate that last point because it's an important point. If you use a deferred object outside of an Angular aware context, outside the digest loop, you might be surprised to find that your methods simply aren't being called until the next digest loop. Um, here's a test that proves it. This test is taken from the Angular code itself. All we're doing is setting up a deferred object and a promise, and then we set up a callback to save off the promise's uh, return value, or the resolved value. Um, and then we tell the deferred to resolve with one, two, three. But what just happened? If you immediately inspect the content of the resolved value, it is still undefined. This test does pass, by the way. Um, but then if you apply on the root scope, then you actually find it to be resolved. So the Q service is Angular aware. It works with the digest loop exclusively. And uh, this is just a nice reminder of that. So they, promises really are everywhere. And they should be in your code and my code as well. If you have services that do asynchronous operations, I strongly, strongly encourage you to use promises instead of taking callbacks as function parameters for doing these operations and notifying your callers. It took me about a year of awareness of promises before I really got it and was converted to the idea of doing promises for everything. Here's the good news. If you've got a whole pile of uh, services and functions in your app that take callbacks as function parameters, it's not a problem. You can actually support both modes until you get rid of the, the function parameters. It's really easy to return a promise and also receive a callback parameter as a function argument and just both resolve the deferred and call the callback so you can maintain callers that are doing it the old way and callers that are doing it the new way. And that's what we're doing in our app as we slowly remove all the crap code that I wrote uh, two years ago. Um, Anyway, a couple of other cool things you can look into is the, the Bluebird project, which is a pretty cool library. It does a lot of really slick stuff with promises that let you do some really cool things. Um, and browsers are providing native promises very soon. In fact, um, Angular's uh, 1.3 Q service has an API that is semantically equivalent to the browser um, native interface. Um, in the end, this is all I want, I think, everyone to take away from this talk. If you have asynchronous operations, and you have functions that are wrapping those operations, don't do it this way by passing callbacks to them. Do it this way by returning promises. It's functional, and you will be happy. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK. We do, I would say we do have two prizes, and there are questions. Are you raising a hand for a question? You really wanted this Bluetooth selfie wand, didn't you? OK. <laughs> this could be yours if the question, all right, go ahead. Yes, but if you do that, now you've actually combined dynamic and static because you'll have to write function argument names in your callback function, and you won't actually know what those are supposed to be. So, no, it'd be slick if you could do dependency injection or something like some weird kind of thing. Okay, there are like four or five more hands. Uh, oh, come get your Bluetooth selfie wand. <laughs> I know you wanted it. Um, okay, randomly selected. How about here? Uh, I'll post a link on, the, on Twitter, and I'll tag NG Europe. Does that count as a question? Because if so, you just got an orange speaker. <laughs> Come get it. All right. <laughs> it's shaped like a football. Maybe we can. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Oh, should we do a third question? Go ahead. There's no prize. I will give you a hug if you if it would. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Or not. If you don't, if you don't want to hug, that's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. And sorry, I failed to restate the questions. Go ahead.
Ah, so intuitively I don't understand why we would want promises to wait until the next digest loop. That's just to make sure that when they execute, a dirty check will happen after your then function gets called, just so that it's all Angular aware. Otherwise, you'd have to apply the digest yourself. Okay, but isn't that solved with Angular 2.0, though? Like, we don't have to do that anymore. Are, uh, are you talking about the version of Angular that doesn't exist yet? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, it is solved in that version. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm really looking forward to it. I don't know the answer to that. I'm not. Yes, we'll be having a very different conversation on into the <laughs> Okay, uh, are we out of time? Uh, uh, the clock says zero seconds, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, I was wondering if you have uh, you all that you resolve all requests uh, you're sending and then you get uh, callback, uh, not callback, but promises resolved and they all are uh, But uh, can you uh, know if one of the Ah, so what happens when you do q.all and one of the promises is rejected? Is that the, is that the question? Yeah, um, so I, uh, I don't know the answer to that, actually. I think it's just your, your final promise will get rejected as well, so you would provide a second callback function. Yeah, I don't know how to detect which one it was. Obviously, I'm not very good at writing error handling code. Okay. Do they all get passed to the failed callback, to the rejected callback? Okay. Can you tell which one was rejected and which one was not? I don't know. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>